Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us here on Health Professional Radio. In this segment, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Benjamin Lowentritt. He's joining us here as lead investigator on the Erlida study. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Lowentritt. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Now, I did mention that you were a lead investigator on the Erlita study. Yeah, I, so I was I was part of a working group and, and the lead author on a, a recently uh, presented abstract uh, mm-hmm. looking at some uh, data around uh, not just the medicine Erlita, but um, other medications and how they're being used and how patients are responding in the real world. Mm-hmm. Give us a bit of your professional background, if you would, and then let's talk about this real-world study in metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer, or MCSPC. Yes, I'm the medical director of the Comprehensive Prostate Cancer Program at Chesapeake Urology. We're a, a, group, a large group of physicians, uh, almost all urologists in uh, Maryland, mostly around Baltimore and suburban D.C., this trial was, you know, with this this investigation was an interesting kind of way to look at uh, data that we're able to get out of other community groups like my mine and and large groups around the country, uh, where as opposed to the data that we're able to get from a prospective randomized trial that leads to the approval of a medication. This was looking more at what can we glean from the information that's actually in the in the electronic medical record for patients that are on the treatments after they've been approved. So, you know, looking at what's actually happening in a real world setting as to po- as opposed to what's sort of the idealized setting of a clinical trial. Um and, and it's it's you know, there's uh it's exciting sort of that we're able to do this now because the electronic medical record has or should enable us to get more information uh, like this so that we can really understand the impact that the, the new treatments are having. Talk about the analysis design of this trial, if you would. Sure. So what this trial actually was doing is, is what we've, we've done some uh, evaluation of, of how patients seem to be responding to uh, therapy after the, the treatments that were approved in 2019 were starting to be implemented. So in 2019, there were two medications, both apalutamide, which is Erlita, and enzalutamide, which is Extandi, that were approved for use with traditional androgen deprivation therapy or hormonal therapy for patients with metastatic castration-sensitive prostate cancer. So essentially, essentially adding on these treatments to the prior kind of standard of care with, with hormone therapy uh, to get better outcomes. And, and these two drugs have similar mechanisms and, and have, you know, kind of in the same space in the disease. Um, and when we were looking at some of the prior investigation, which was much more about adherence to medications and whether or not patients were staying on, you know, as, as directed and, and looked like they were actually getting the benefit, um, there was a signal that, that there might have been a differential benefit between the two drugs. And so what this uh, analysis was really doing was seeing if we could pull out if there were, truly was a different response that was happening between patients getting the Erlita versus those getting enzalutamide or Extandi. So um, the, uh, the, what we did find when we looked at it was that there did appear to be a faster and deeper response as measured by the PSA. And um, for any of us that treat prostate cancer, we know that PSA is the main biomarker that we use to track activity of the disease. And, and there, there's a sort of you know, long history of, of what PSA is and what mm-hmm. the impact is uh, in screening. But in following patients that are already have prostate cancer, we know that it is a, it's an extremely valuable tool uh, to understand the, the, the depth of a response to a treatment and, and the activity of the disease. So the, what we specifically were looking at was how many patients were getting a 90% or greater reduction in their PSA and how quickly that was happening. Um, and this was uh, information that was pulled from the, the medical records when possible. Um, so the big challenge with a study like this is trying to make sure you're looking at the right patients. So uh, a big part of what we were doing was trying to create definitions so that we were weeding out patients that might be getting these drugs for other indications because they mm-hmm. both have other indications for other stages of the disease. 
and trying to make sure we're looking at the right group of patients. So we set a bunch of definitions, meaning you know they couldn't have, uh, they had to have a defi- they had to have a diagnosis of metastases because that's in the definition, um, which which eliminates one of the other indications that's out there. Um, they had to have just started the medication. They had to, um, you know, and then and then really, if we didn't have a clear evidence that they they were in this situation, we dropped them out of the analysis. Well, is this going to greatly impact the the status quo when it comes to looking at PSA responses? You know, I think it, it's a great question. I think the the what we found was that the group that got Erlita or Apalutamide did seem to have a more rapid and deeper response um, to. Uh, uh, with a PSA 90, and, and that was seen early in the, the, the course of the disease and really maintained that, that difference between the group that got uh, Erlita versus enzalutamide. And uh, so we saw that differential benefit throughout the course of the couple of years that we were following the patients. Um, so I think it's, it's a very interesting signal. Um, because, you know, the, the default has been that we kind of assume that these are very similar medicines with similar responses. Mm-hmm. And while I don't know that this kind of evidence can definitively, it's not a prospective definitive comparison trial. So I, you know, I need to put that caveat in there, but it does sort of create that question to say, okay, in, in a world where we do have choices of, of medications and where we're trying to get the patients the, the best option, you know, first, uh, we know that once patients have failed one of these medications, they're not likely to do well on the other one. So we're trying to find, you know, anything that says, okay, what really is going to benefit the patient the, the best? I think that this analysis gives us that, uh, at least that question is, okay, maybe there is a difference here. And at least for further investigation or in clinical practice, I think as as, as physicians are choosing treatments for their patients, it certainly may impact what they're doing. You know, I, I don't think this has definitively answered the question, mm-hmm. uh, but it certainly is suggestive of a different response. So what do you think the, the next steps may be um, looking into the future stemming from this analysis? The group that did this analysis, we're certainly continuing the real-world evidence, you know, approach. And I think, what, like I said at the beginning, what's exciting about real-world evidence is that it really does get to what the actual patient experience is like and what the physician experience is like in, in using these treatments, et cetera. So we're looking at, at comparison with other medications. We're looking at, uh, you know, evidence of, of side effects and other, other um you know, consequences of being on medication. So the, the hope is we'll have some other uh, signals like this that may help guide care. Um, I do think that this type of study, you know, will likely lead to uh, some degree of comparisons, comparison studies. Mm-hmm. I think that you don't see a lot of head-to-head comparison studies in a prospective fashion uh, for many reasons, but I think that that, that this will hopefully give uh, a little push to get us to do that in, in at least a small population to see if we can, if this, if this signal that we saw in the real world evidence is, is a true one. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we will get more answers like this, but I, you know, the field is, is evolving so quickly that, you know, I think we're trying to get data from any source that we can that's, that's reliable and, and, and work with it. I think this, this emerging real world evidence data uh, is, is being used now more and more with, you know, more and more confidence because that we're getting good information and that this is something that we can act on. I failed to ask you where this data was presented. Uh, would you give us that information, please? And um, also tell us where our listeners sure. can learn more. So this was uh, at, at the recent uh, ASCO GU conference. So the American Society of Clinical Oncology's specifically genitourinary uh, disease conference that was in San Francisco in early February. Um, and uh, if you can go to the, the ASCO websites to get the, the abstracts and, and learn more about what was presented. Well, Dr. Lowentritt, I appreciate you giving us some of your time this morning. Thank you so much for joining us here on Health Professional Radio. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Benjamin Lowentritt. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen in, download Download SoundCloud and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com health professional radio.